There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Friday Reads. This one's going to be a little bit of a patchwork Friday Reads. Not much. I'm going to do probably 90% of it right now, and I'm finishing up one book later this morning that I'll add my final thoughts on that book later on today. It's kind of a busy day. I got a doctor's appointment this morning, which kind of throws a monkey wrench in my usual Friday routine. I have so much to tell you, but before I get started on book stuff... Let me tell you a story. Don't tell Kenji. I told you this. But he has a phobia about insects. Uh, any bigger than a fly. He just freaks out. One of my favorite memories. I'm, and I have such a sadistic sense of humor. It's not like I uh, set, set him up to be scared. But when he gets scared, I find it just absolutely hilarious. I'm such a sadist. All right, guys. I need some advice because... In the very next moment, this audio quality just went down for no apparent reason. I'm recording on a Blue Yeti mic, and I've noticed that when I put it on the desk, the audio quality is poor, so I started putting it on a plastic container, or this time a cardboard box, but it was perfect up until now, and for the rest of the thing, it's really not, it's kind of crappy. Do these microphones wear out or <laughs> any advice is driving me crazy when i record in other locations i don't seem to have any trouble with the quality of the recording but at my desk i don't know frustrating sorry that the quality of the audio is noticeably less from here on in and one of my favorite memories of kenji from many years ago when he came back to canada with me for a visit and uh, was, we had company and sitting around in the living room and in the evening and a couple crickets wandered out from under the sofa where he was sitting. And the next thing I knew, he was standing on the sofa, <laughs> scared. And my friend Maury uh, made a video of it, but it was on one of those newfangled things that where the video disappears after ten, five hours or something, Snapchat, what is it? So, because she was going to send it to me, and then it was too late. I think Kenji might have slipped her some bills not to send it to me, but it's one of my favorite memories. So, um, the other day, there I was, minding my own business, cooking dinner late at night. Kenji was getting home even later than that. I knew he was on his way home, and I, I don't know what I was making, but I needed the big pot that's on the top of the refrigerator, and, and when I pulled it off, a cockroach, a, much bigger than the size of my thumb, um, was in the pot and I'm not scared of, I, I should have said this before but I'm not scared of cockroaches or any insects really some big spiders might scare me I don't think I've ever seen a really big spider in real life but I think that would freak me out but most insects including cockroaches uh, don't phase me at all so I'm the one that is your best friend when you find a cockroach because I will get rid of it and it doesn't bother me but this one was so big that it did freak me out. So I, I threw it into the trash, and the bag was less than a, a quarter full, but I tied up the bag, and I put it down at the front door, because I was busy in the middle of cooking. I had stuff on the stove. I couldn't take it right out to the trash, but I put it downstairs for Kenji and sent him a message and explained that there was a huge cockroach, <laughs> and it was in the trash can. It was tied up securely. Please take it out to the trash. Well... He wasn't very happy that I told him that story. He wished that I hadn't told him because he said, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. And he did take it out, but he was just, oh, oh, oh he just freaked out deep uh, at the very depths of his being. And he said, his eyes were wide. I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. Oh, my God. Do you think there's other ones in the apartment? I don't remember seeing ever one that big. And for all I know, it wasn't a cockroach, but it was a huge cockroach-esque or cricket-like thing that was so big. So, I really had to work hard not to start laughing because he was so freaked out. I actually found um, fake cockroaches online. You can buy them on Amazon for six or something for like two dollars or something. And they're very lifelike, and I had thought that I might use them for practical jokes but now i think i just can't go there can i i, I just can't so 
so that happened and now the next thing is a bookish accessory I'm not one for bookish accessories I think that that topic has that prompt has shown up on a few tags over the years and I really poo poo it um, but I bought this it is a neck light very gay looking one and you put it around your neck and then it has three 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 uh, levels what that's the lowest medium and brightest now that's not going to show up on the thing but it does add a little extra layer of light as a, as my as I age and as my eyes age I'm finding the lighting sometimes in this apartment is not bright enough especially on my exercise bike putting this around my neck and it and you can it's you know tr you train it on wherever the book that you're holding is and it adds the extra bit of lighting to the situation and I think I look really cool with it don't you <laughs> <laughs> it's 20 bucks or something. New toy. All right, I don't have time to fool around anymore. Let's get to the books. Actually, first, let's look at the weekend review. There's nobody running interference for Mavis Gallant, and she was quite happy to sign every book, and she wrote in each one to Sean Mooney, Mavis Gallant. And we were chatting amiably, and she was just lovely. She's just a lovely person. Does not suffer fools gladly because yeah. the, uh, the the slut in me wants to know: Is it as sexual, as sexually exciting as uh, normal people was? I think even more so. And okay, she, and she, I and have she... one bale and seven books that I finished. One of which I will finish in an hour or something, and started one. So let's uh, first do the bale. I had decided to bail on this about a week ago, and I. I was too busy to get around to bailing, so I did bail on the Joyce Carol Oates collection. <laughs> Lonesome Dove, is it? Lonesome something. Hi, Lonesome Selected Stories, 1966 to th 2006. When I checked in on all the books I was reading a few weeks back, I said that I hadn't enjoyed the really modern ones that were at the beginning of the collection, but I was hoping that when I got back to um, the, the 1966 stories and worked my way up that I might enjoy some of her earlier work and I didn't so I read a third of it it took me 11 months to read a third of it and I just wasn't enjoying I don't remember really enjoying any of them but I may have enjoyed one or two seven or eight months ago that I don't remember now but no I just you know with all that I've got on my plate and this was a very mediocre reading experience I think and Eric, if you're watching, I love a lot of Joyce Carol Oates' uh, novellas and novels. I think maybe her short stories are not for me. Uh, anyway, enough said about that. So yes, I've had a really good reading week, but what that means is I read some mediocre, some really good, yeah, so quite a mixed bag, but got through a lot. Had the time and made the time where I wasn't rushing with any of them, but I could finish off because I wanted to clear a space to move into October. Today is October 1st and start Victober uh, without feeling all this uh, weight of my current reads. It's now down to, I think it'll be down to 22. The first one I finished was another short story collection that was a buddy read with Britta Bowler, The Pain Tree by Olive Senior. Olive Senior is a uh, Jamaican-Canadian writer, and this was the first anything that I'd read by her. And I didn't end up enjoying the collection as much as Britta did, you know, or as much as a lot of the other reviews on Goodreads. Uh, I think she's just not a writer for me, but I also wonder if her style may have developed since this collection was published, I think, in 2004. I, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't hate it. It was a three-star read. There were a couple stories that stood out as being pretty decent four-star reads, but most of them were two or three-star reads for me. I didn't think the characterization went deep enough to hold my interest, and I don't think I penalized her for this because this is a deficit, this is a deficiency in me as a reader of Jamaican literature. She is mixed race, and her stories, the way that she talked about or didn't talk about race in her stories, I couldn't figure out very many of the characters were. Are these black Jamaicans or white Jamaicans? Um, the only thing I could figure out was some were poor and some were not. And the, the, 
and is it all on, an automatic assumption we should make that if they're upper class, upper middle class, that they are axiomatically white? I just couldn't get a frame to kind of with that. And Britta and I talked about it a lot. I don't think she struggled as much as I do did. I don't didn't necessarily agree with every ascription that she made, but oh, I think these characters are black, and so on. It's just confusing. But uh, that's I think a more perceptive reader, like Britta, or like somebody who's more versed in Jamaican culture, um, kind of the the, uh, the indicators of race. Certainly, uh, th there's a lot about class, but I couldn't sort out f most of the characters into white or black. And is was that the point? Did I miss something by not being able to figure that out? I don't know. But the, the, as short stories, these didn't really work for me. They, I am glad I read them. I would try something else by her, but uh, they, they, these didn't work for me. Big news, people. I have finally finished the Alexandria Quartet. I have this mismatched set because I bought the Justine one with the gorgeous cover. And this, these stupid people, Penguin, I think, they never issued the rest of the series. So I, this is a newer, a very new edition from Faber. So I finished the last volume, Clea. And... Uh, the first thing to say about this is I have now joined the Naxus Audio Club. I bought a one-year membership, and they had all of these on audiobooks. So I did this one on audio while reading it. And the strangest thing was that the final chapter is not on the audiobook. So I didn't do the final chapter <laughs> on audio. I didn't understand what that was about. And then a buddy read with Adam, and Adam's edition was not this edition, and he had different chapter numbers or part numbers. His was t the names of the br breaks between chapters was very completely different than mine, so this, uh, there's a lot of versions of this. Um, I didn't like this one as well as the first two either, but it was a four-star read for me, and I would still give, even though the final two volumes were four star reads I would still give the entire series a five star you know it was it was just a, a tremendous reading experience I could name about 11 different things that were thematically important in the book and I don't know if that would really give you enough of an idea but it's one of the most fascinating series of novels I've ever read and I you know I'm not a big reader of series of novels but the way that he upended the the way each character showed up in the previous volume, in the subsequent volume, it was so fabulously destabilizing that it was compulsive. There were a couple characters I didn't find nearly as interesting, and so that and they t had more airtime in the in the last two volumes. Um, and there were a couple things in the final volume where kind of the last two characters standing that hadn't jumped each other's bones, jumped each other's bones, and that relationship didn't really resonate for me. I thought it was, I couldn't picture it. It didn't seem like it should be happening. It didn't, I wasn't interested in that. Um, so a couple things that were a little bit, and boy, I mean, I'm not a political reader like some, but bo uh, I think one of the reasons Lawrence Durrell is not so widely read now is that he's really got a lot of problematic stuff about race and gender and non heterosexual uh, lives that you know repays an analysis and I am sensitive to those things and there were a few places where I really cringed but I didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater and I thought it was a really compelling I, I, I want to reread it I think in about five years with 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 or without Adam because it's just one of the most compulsive works of literary fiction I've ever read so that was tremendous. And I have finished the Ursula Orange book. I think I had just started it last week, didn't I? Anyway, Company in the Evening was published in 1944. And this one wasn't nearly as good as the first two. In a way that was rem vaguely reminiscent of the, the last novel of hers I read, Tom Tiddler's Ground. Um, it started to really go off the rails by about the middle. And then she re she rescued it such that this ended up being a four-star read, but it was sitting at a three-star read for the kind of the middle third of it. I was really unsatisfied. I am going to do a full review, just f f to be completest about all of the Ursula Orange novels in from this publisher, Dean Street Press, the furled middle brow imprint. 
So briefly, what I enjoyed here was the independent-minded, uh, witty protagonist. This one is first person, and my buddy reader Leah pointed out that the other two, Begin Again and Tom Tiddler's Ground, were third person, which I didn't remember. But anyway, the, the protagonists are really wanting independence, wanting to kind of buck, buck the norms of gender and what it means to be a wife and a mother. You know, let's not go too far with that. I mean, it was still a very convention. They, they were still, by any standards of the year 2021, uh, pretty conventional, but you could really feel them in kind of a smart-alecky, very entertaining way, uh, bucking the system, carving out identities. I also love the way Ursula Orange shows people at work. But what was really a serious flaw for me with this novel is it's set during the Blitz, it's set on the countryside, and the references to the war are so passing. Like, the, the narrator comes right out and says, I know you don't want to hear anything about the war. Well, that was probably valid. People reading a novel in 1944 might be looking for an escape. But as a reader, all these decades later, I think she might as well have set it not during the war, because it just, that was really unsatisfying. And, more than that, the protagonist, Vicky, had so much tragedy around her. Her brother had been killed at Dunkirk six months before. And so the widow, who's 19 and pregnant, moves in with her, and you would never know that the protagonist or the widow were grieving. Like, she just didn't treat any of the deeper themes. So why have tragedies in a novel if you're not going to show your characters reacting to them? That really bugs me, and it really bugged me here. But the protagonist does go on a bit of a journey into her deeper self. That sounds a really pat way to put it, where it did come back up to a four-star read. Enough about that. And just in the nick of time, for the end of the Kenyan readathon, I finished the, the group read, The Other Woman, a collection of short stories by Grace Ogot. And I gave it four stars because it was so interesting. The stories were so interesting. I didn't like the way they were written, most of them. I didn't find a lot of literary quality, but what held my interest consistently was the way these stories showed Kenya in the early post-colonial days, and especially the women and how they were kind of trapped in marriages or in gendered, really misogynist situations and uh, violent situations. As stories, as the events that were being narrated, it was really compelling. As short stories, in a, from a literary point of view, didn't really care for them, but Lexa, of Lexa Reads, the organizer of the readathon, she had, I'm pretty sure she had a group chat on Instagram about this book. I was not able to watch it, given the time difference, but uh, I will put the link in the show notes, and I'm looking forward to watching that to see things that I might have missed, and um, maybe give me a deeper appreciation of this collection. And oh my god, last night I finished Nupaming, The Cure for White Ladies by, by Leanne Bata Samosake Simpson. Now I have to first say that I found, Lindy and I both in separately found uh, her on a CBC radio thing where she pronounces her own name uh, uh, differently, the middle name, differently than the one I have always been referring to. Oh, and I've forgotten how it was pronounced differently, but it was different. So I'm going to stick with the other one because I've kind of got it in my head. Batasa Musake. But I've also seen her on videos where she was being interviewed and didn't visibly cringe when people pronounced it. Batasa Musake. Still a bit of a mystery. Be that as it may, I love this so much. I didn't. I think I understood about 40% of it, 30% of it. But what an engrossing... It's a misnomer to call it experimental because that makes it seem like it's intellectually challenging. It's, it's on a whole other level than that. The character who we see as frozen under the ice, and he's kind of the grand narrator. Then we meet all of the characters that are different parts of his, of their self. Simpson um, reproduces the Anishinaabe grammar, which does not have a he or she, so every single character in this book is a they. And so there are seven main characters. Aki Wenzi, the old man who represents the narrator's will. I'm not sure about all the pronunciations here. Ninatig, 
the maple tree representing the old man's lungs. Mindy Muyen, the old woman representing his conscience. Sabe or Sabe, a gentle giant, their bone marrow. Attic, the caribou, their nervous system, and Asin and Lucy, the humans who represent their eyes, ears, and brains. So, you, when you're reading it, you quickly realize that these odd, deeply fascinating characters that you can kind of almost, I did, I just kind of put it out of my mind for large chunks of the text that these were representing parts of the narrator's self because they were so alive and vibrant and curious and the writing was at by turns funny and challenging in terms of a lot of Ojibwe, untranslated Ojibwe. I found most of them when I was looking it up and in terms of, it, I found actually in the acknowledgments at the end that she had referred to the same online Ojibwe dictionary that I was using. The part of it that I don't really know how to uh, talk about yet, if ever, is that it's such a radical work of decolonizing literary fiction. Holy smokes, I just loved it. I'm not going to attempt to do a review, I don't think, unless I, maybe if I read it three more times, but I recommend it very highly. If you kind of step back when you hear the term experimental fiction, don't let that put you off this one. I can't remember if Brian of Bookish has, did do a full review. I remember he said he was still kind of processing it. And Mark Nash has done a full review, which I haven't watched yet. Um, which I'm looking forward to watching, and these are my comments at this time, but this was a profoundly moving, entertaining, and lusciously literary and politically challenging work of fiction. Oh my god! Uh, less successful by the end is Christina Henrique's The Book of Unknown Americans. I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. It was sitting at a solid four-star read, but there was something about the ending. In a way, I want to say it was too sentimental, but I, I don't mean that it was overly happy. That is not true. But the way the plot resolved itself, there was something about the character work was not nuanced enough for that ending. So I was pulled out of the story when the stuff that happened, happened, because the characters, while I liked them and I was appreciating the story and enjoying it as a kind of a work of commercial fiction that didn't, wasn't going all that deep, but the characters seemed vibrant enough, I was interested, I cared about the, especially the, the two teenagers, but then the, uh, no, it wasn't a smooth ending for me, so I knocked another star off, three stars. Um, it's a book about Lat Latinx immigrants in the States. And uh, this was for the, uh, the author is of Panamanian background. And so this is what I read for Invisible Cities. And I'm glad I read it. I would try something else by her. I think this, I don't know if this is her debut, but uh, it didn't really work by the end. Hey, okay, well, I'm back. It's about 12 hours later, 7 p.m. It'll be late before I get this finished. But we had a busy day and a very wet day. Typhoon came this morning. It wasn't that it was just heavy rain. I don't think it ever got much more than that, but it was certainly, I was soaked by, I'm not sure where to look. Look there, Sean. But I was soaked by the time I got home from the hospital and uh, had to take all my clothes off and put my pants out to dry in the, we got a dryer thing in our shower room. So I may or may not be wearing pants right now. I'm trying an experiment. This microphone always works reliably on the computer, but the built-in video camera on this computer, this $2,000 Apple computer I bought, I don't know, eight years ago, it's probably old now, but it never ever had a high quality video camera. So I've got an external camera that I'm using for Zoom. It's not the best, but I'm gonna try it because the audio is good. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a break from that kind of creaky sounding audio. So I guess if the microphone always works when it's plugged into the computer, but it doesn't necessarily work that great when it's plugged into my iPad near the computer, I think there might be some interference. I don't know, I'm just really stupid about this. So I have now finished uh, this uh, novel from Cameroon in translation from the French. Season of the Shadow by Eleonora Miano, translated from the French by Gila Walker. Five stars. What a phenomenal read. It is a work of historical fiction 
which imagines that first contact between a completely insular tribe of peoples in what is now Cameroon, far from the coast. They'd never, they've never been to the coast. They don't have any conception of what the ocean is. And their village, their tribe is raided in the middle of the night and a dozen of their men are, are taken away. They're taken actually to be sold to slave traders. The whole novel is the reaction of this tribe. They can't piece it together. They have their own superstitions and spiritual, existential, uh, political, geographical mindset that is completely upended by this trauma. They can't figure it out. And so they isolate the mothers of these men thinking there's something kind of spiritual, wonky happening. In some ways, the culture, this ancient culture is matrilineal, but yet there's a whole bunch of kind of um, very different kinds of sexism as per separating the mothers of the men who disappeared because there might be some spiritual contamination going on. There's all kinds of stuff. It's so fascinating. I, I loved it. I mean, it's a harrowing story, but it's it's an incredible work of uh, imaginative fiction about the African side of all of this. And, oh, my God, for a 233-page novel, I can't believe how much she packed into it. Really well-drawn characters. It's very dramatic in places, but also shows such a rich, layered worldview and historical work of kind of imaginative history. I mean, I don't know how much she's basing it on actual oral history of this part of Africa. I have no idea. I'm curious, but I just thought it was phenomenal. I'm going to do a full review. Wow. Uh, By the way, this was for Women in Translation Month. When was that? Several months ago. I also need to correct an error because I said I'd started one. That's not true. I have a mental block about this second book. I forgot to mention that I would be starting it last Friday Reads. Made a mental note. Don't forget to talk about it next week. Completely forgot. This is my new buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life. Invisible North, The Search for Answers on a Troubled Reserve by the journalist Alexandra Shimo. And it is about a fly in. Uh, In other words, the only way you can get to this reserve in northern Ontario is to fly in. A fly in northern Ontario reserve that had made headlines every five or ten years in recent decades, Keshetawan. And it has made headlines because they've had bo- uh, poisoned water systems and horrific drug addiction problems. And it's just so far away from settler civilization and the governments that are responsible for kind of managing indigenous issues that they're just woefully neglected. This is a book that was written. I think 15 or 16 years ago. So there are developments that I have Googled and it isn't a lot better, a little this, a smidge better since then. But wow, Alexandra Shimo is an amazing writer. It almost feels like we're reading a novel, but it just fills me with indignation. She, I don't know how much of a deep dive she went into the history, but she did enough to tell us something that I have read in several other books. And my colonial brain keeps suppressing this fact from my memory. So I never remember it for long enough. So maybe if I tell you about it, it will stick. These, this reserve, Kashetuan, has been petitioning the government, the federal government, um, for more than 100 years, asking for help about this, that, and the other thing. And the government just ignores them. That is the history of settler Indigenous relations in Canada from the get-go. Today is the first national holiday of reconciliation. I'm pretty much of a cynic, but we'll see what it develops into. I imagine it will develop into what all national holidays that commemorate anything become just a day off. But this book is yet another really challenging read. Part memoir, part history of the Canadian Reserves. An expansive exploration and unorthodox take on First Nations issues is what the blurb says. And because my brain is a little fried, I'm just going to 
quote that and move on. And now let's go to the other book that I started and go back to the crappy audio. Sally Rooney's new novel, Beautiful World, Where Are You? Um, I'm loving it. I'm not very far into it. Just starting chapter four, page 38. She's just such a gifted writer. I don't have any hate for Sally Rooney. I didn't like her conversations with friends, but I absolutely loved everything else I've read. And I think I'm going to absolutely love this. Very simple writing, but just capturing moments and capturing emotions in a way that just I'm um, gobsmacked in places. And she writes about sex in a way. I I'm kind of repeating what Alex, who was my guest on Bite Size Book Chats last night, who talked about this novel. I don't want to just regurgitate what he said, but I agree so far with what he said. Uh, you know, it's about politics. There are these long emails, which some people like and others don't. I've only encountered one of those long emails, which is a full chapter, and I liked it well enough but she writes women so well women of this generation and this age um in a way that takes me back to when i was a woman of that age when i was a gay man i just relate to everything so yeah i uh, i don't really have any more to say but i'm certainly deeply engaged in it so i finished seven bailed on one eight books off my current reads so i'm gonna start four and then from now on, as long as I can keep my current reads to around 20, I'm not. I'm going to do one for one, uh, but I don't want it to go higher than that. But one for one for a while. Let's see how that goes, shall we? Um, and I'm really excited to start Victober. So my two, the two Victober books I'm going to start, the Canadian classic Roughing It in the Bush by Susanna Moody. Nupaming was written as kind of a decolonizing indigenous response to this 1852 or 1857 memoir and that's the only reason I want to read it because it just sounds so boring but I think maybe the nature writing might appeal to me in a way that it wouldn't have even two years ago but certainly I'm interested to catch the things that Leanne Simpson is reacting to so I can start that and also this Irish novel if you saw my Victoria TBR I'm ignoring England and focusing on its possessions for Victoria this year and uh, so George Moore's Esther Waters which is about I think a maid that gets taken advantage of and is left with a baby as a single mother in 19th century I don't even know where this novel is set I'll tell you next week this is a buddy read with Joe Smith and we're taking a relaxed pace. I think we're doing it over five weeks. So I will have read a little bit of this by the time you, I see you next week. So those are my Victober reads. I'm going to start one for Invisible Cities. So this month it's Sweden. And I had this book. I don't remember why I bought it. The Family Clause by Jonas Hassan Kamiri. And translated from the Swedish by Alice Menzies. It is a family drama about immigrants. I mean, immigrants, I think, a few generations ago, because the grandfather has gone abroad, and I don't even know which country yet, and he returns to Sweden from abroad uh, to visit his adult children. Now, that's strange if it says he returns home from abroad to visit his adult children. So, boy, interesting use of home and then visit. So, I'll, get, I'll sort it all out once I start it, but I'm really looking forward to starting it this week. And this is a buddy read I'm having with uh, my cousin Lindsay. This was a book that was trumpeted by Yetta from the channel Drawn to Stories, and he loved it. So because it has the word sharks in the title, and I don't even know if how much sharks are in the novel, well, I'll find out. Sharks in the Time of Saviors by Kawhi Strong Washburn. This is set in Hawaii. I think it must have quite a bit to do with sharks. Yes, it does. And my cousin Lindsay is obsessed with sharks. So she had never heard of the novel. We're going to buddy read it. We're going to do maybe two. Our plan, these plans often don't materialize the way I announce them. So take this with a grain of salt. But I think we're going to do two separate Zoom chats this month. The first on the first half and the second on the second half. But looking forward to getting started with this one. Happy Victobering, if you observe. Happy reading uh, regardless. Thanks for watching.